Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. There are no traffic jams along the extra mile when you're studying for your bar exam. And now your hosts, Jackson Mummy and Megan Saya from Celebration Bar Review. Well, hey, everybody, welcome. We are glad to have you with us back after a week off and uh, big painting project going on last week flooring project going on now. I have no idea what you're going to see going on behind me during the webinar. Could be anything. It could be a new drinking game. How many construction guys walk past Jackson in the background? Anyway, glad to be with you. Glad to have all of you here. As always, Megan will be joining me in just a few minutes. We have a fair number of questions since we were away for a week, and we want to update you on what's been going on around the bar exam world. Obviously, as we're getting closer to the end of April, we're still awaiting some results in a couple of big states. Megan and I will talk about that. We'll preview for you some things that have been going on and what we think is going to be happening over the next few weeks. So in any of that's our plan. Let's bring Megan in. We'll chat about what's going on. Hi, how are you? I'm doing very well. How are you? Doing great. Thanks. Yeah. So it's hard to believe that we are nearly at the end of April. It has flown by, hasn't it? Yes, it has. It has. So we're uh, starting to get to the the point in time where I think we hit May, June, and people taking the July bar feel like, oh, this is really real. This is really happening. Yeah, it's very real. And of course, we're getting some results from some states. And, and of course, we've got people transitioning into the July and even the February 2022 exams. So I'll let you kick us off. What's the news around the bar exam world this week? Yeah, so more states are going remote. This last couple of weeks since we had our last webinar, we've got Arizona, Michigan, and Maine all announced a remote exam for the next bar. It's crazy to think that this is still in flux, but it is. So definitely, we say it every week, we'll keep saying it every week, make sure that you're getting the emails from your jurisdiction because you need to know things like if they decide to go online because man, there's still movement. Every few days, it seems like another state pops on the online bandwagon. So, But to be clear, that. Texas is still in person, right? Yes. Yeah, as of today, Texas is still in person. Yeah. That is yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay, so that's all interesting stuff. More states drifting into the online world. And it's interesting because there may be less pandemic pressure to do it and more just We've done it online and it worked and it's more convenient and people seem to like it better. So an interesting change in our focus. A year ago, it was like, well, we had to go on online to keep people safe. Now I'm not hearing the safety factor quite so much. I'm hearing some other things. We'll see. I think the decision-making process is different from state to state. Definitely. Yeah. Some of these smaller states, definitely a different calculation than the large ones. So yeah, we'll see what happens with Texas. I'm pretty curious. I'm still not convinced that it's actually going to happen in person in Texas, but it may. But we've seen this song and dance from many states, including Texas in the past, where they said, no, no, we're definitely holding it in person and then made a change. So just be aware if that's you, that that is a possibility for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I also wanted to note that New York is still accepting applications. So if you remember, they have a cap of about 10,000 applicants who they're allowing to sit for this next exam. And as of today, they have not announced that that has been filled. So just so you know, if you're still on the fence about should I take it in New York or not, New York is still accepting applications. And Jackson, I know you did a, we didn't do the webinar last week, but you did release a podcast, correct, where you talked about the New York and the Texas results and the statistics that came out of that. Yeah. The statistics can be so misleading, can't they? And the general popular, the general media take was, hey, bar results, results and pass rates are way up, which is always good news. And we'd love to hear that. However, I think we have to be honest, the re part of the reason the results were up is that the applicant pool was skewed pretty deeply and it was pretty small numbers of people taking it. So if you're interested in that discussion that I had with myself <laughs> last week, because Megan was getting vaccinated, check out uh, last week's podcast. We talk about that. We've also got a great interview in there with a uh, successful Florida bar taker. But I think that in general, when you're looking at these pass rates, what you want to keep in mind is that the applicant pool impacts the pass rates pretty significantly. 
And when you cut down from five or 6,000 applicants to 2,000, and then you say only first time takers can take the exam, gee, do you think the results are gonna get better? Of course they will. It's interesting to see as I looked at the statistics around the country, we have some states from the February 2021 exam with really good pass rates. And then we have some that are just abysmally low. And there's not really a rhyme or reason yet, except the size of the, the applicant pool. And in some cases, the applicant pool is so small that they only had a few people taking the exam and then your numbers get really screwed up. That's an interesting development. I think the only other question really is, what does it tell us about California and Georgia, two of the big states that are still coming? And the answer is, I don't know. I can't really tell. Florida was not great. New York was better, but that they changed their pool of applicants. Texas had a better exam, but they switched from Texas to UBE. So typically the things we would look at as being indicators of what might happen in California and Georgia, I'm not sure they're valid. Do you, do you think? No, I completely agree. I think New York, you can throw that out the window in terms of that telling you anything about what's going to happen in the future or with another state because they really only let first time takers and a small pool of other people take it. So when you don't allow in people who have failed the exam multiple times or graduated law school a long time ago, you would hope that that the positivity rate, the pass rate would go up, which of course it did. And then with Texas switching from the te Texas exam to the UBE, again, you would expect that the, the pass rate would go up significantly, which it did, but it doesn't really tell you anything. California did not switch to the UBE, obviously. Georgia did not switch to the UB, so that doesn't really give you any good information, I don't think, yeah. to extrapolate from. So, yeah. yes, we hope for great higher pass rates in those states as well. California raised their score, right, recently, so we have been well, expecting... They, let's, let's be a heart attack now. I know, sorry. If I raise, I think, I guess I meant raise the threshold for, like, this is passing. Yes, so we ex expect to see, continue to see higher pass rates in California, but again... We just, there's nothing to really compare it to. Yes. So we'll see. There's nothing to do, but wait, I may. So closer to the end of May. So I, I think we do have a little bit of a wait still for several. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in the chat box. What do you think about Washington, D.C.? And remind me, did those, I believe those results were released. I have they not. They were released seen. yesterday. I don't think, I don't think we've got enough to know. There, there was not a big jurisdiction, honestly, and so I don't have statistics yet on D.C. We'll take a look at that, but I think we have to look at the UBE jurisdictions more as an aggregate. We can pull out New York because of the unusual circumstances and pull out Texas, but I think we, we want to look at the broad number of states like Illinois, Colorado, North South Carolina, Alabama, and so on, and try and get an aggregate. We just can't tell enough yet. The other thing I think to keep in mind is that there's not a big difference in the scoring. It's the same test in all the UBE and the examiners in every state are given draft or point sheets. So it's not like they're scoring you differently in DC than they would in North Carolina. So part of what, what goes on there. Right. All right. We did have a question as well about what the pass rate is for foreign trained attorneys in the New York bar. And I can pull yeah, that. Yeah. But so the New York examiner said that there were 857 foreign educated candidates representing 40% of all candidates who sat for the February exam. And the pass rate for foreign educated candidates was 43%, which was up from 31% last year. Again, note that they significantly curtailed who was eligible to sit for the exam. Hence, so great news that the pass rate got up so much higher than the abysmal 31%, but it was very much a cherry picking the applicant. Yeah, you had to have a an LLM from an ABA accredited U.S. law school and be in your first time taking it. That was a very small pool of people, yeah. relatively speaking. I, I'm sure we're going to see a huge number of foreign trained attorneys taking the New York exam in July, and I, I would expect the number will come back down into the 30 percent tile range. Yep. All right. In the chat box, do you have any recommendations of what state to sit? We're going to say our usual disclaimer, we cannot give individual admissions advice that is a violation of our license with the bar examiners. We can say in broad general terms, don't sit in California or Florida or Georgia. <laughs> they're not good states to sit in. We prepare for them because they're so tough and we have uh, great expertise there. But if you can sit in the UBE, go to the UBE. And then I think within the UBE, my decision making tree would be, do I want to be in person or online? Because there are both options depending on different states. And then I think 
asking yourself what jurisdiction might make sense for you. Not that you would practice law in that jurisdiction, but maybe you've got family there or some connection. And, and how big do you want to be? You could take the UBE in New York, which is going to be massive, 10,000 people, or you could take it in New Mexico, which is probably going to be pretty small or any number of states. So some people like bigger jurisdictions, some like smaller. We generally like the DC bar for the UBE. It's a good bar set of bar examiners to work with. We like the, the bar exam in New Mexico. We like, we like all of the bar examiners in case they're listening. We love you all. But really, there's not that big a difference. So I think it's personal preference. Would you add anything to that? Yeah, no. Ingrid said New Jersey or Pennsylvania, which sort of seems to me like a... Pennsylvania is not a UBE state. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so not no. Pennsylvania. Unless you're practicing in Pennsylvania, but that's a whole other state. No. <laughs> yeah. and, and here's the thing about the UBE that people really don't get. So Ingrid wants to be in New Jersey. Okay, good. Ingrid, you could take the bar exam in New Mexico with the UBE, and if you get a high enough score, you can practice in New Jersey. You don't have to go to New Jersey to take the exam or apply in New Jersey. So that's kind of the point I think that, that you want to get at. It, I'm not picking on her, but any UBE jurisdiction, the scores are portable across all of them. So about 32 states or something like that. Right. Because it's the exact same test. So you're all taking the same thing, which leads very nicely into our next question, which is, has Jackson announced yet the essay topics that were in the MEE for February 2021? <laughs> and it's no. And why is that, Jackson? Because they haven't released them in all the jurisdictions. And until they do that, the national conference holds, and they send us an email every season saying, just a reminder, you cannot tell the world what these subjects are until we give you the okay. And we haven't gotten the okay yet. We know the subjects, but if you if actually, most of you, if you're, if you've gotten score sheets from a UBE jurisdiction in February, you took the exam, but your score sheet doesn't list the subjects, which I find fascinating. The national conference is very paranoid about releasing this. I don't know what difference it possibly would make the test right. was over, but there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely we're still waiting on a, several UBE jurisdictions to release. And so they like to hold those for a while. Suspense. Um, Lisa in the chat asks, what changes have been made in the Texas bar? I know that there have been the changes in the structure. Everything. It's not the same exam. Yeah. It's the UBE. It's, you know, two days instead of two and a half days. There's no Texas procedure and evidence. There's no oil and gas. It's not state specific. It is a completely different exam, completely different scoring. Everything is different. The MBE is still there. Even the weight of the MBE is different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. There is no more Texas exam. There's no more New York exam. There's no more lots of states exams. It is the uniform bar exam. So yeah, absolutely different. All right. So this is connected to what we were saying. Someone who is feeling concerned about using up another attempt at the bar and possibly not being successful. And this is a UBE student wondering if they think they should switch to taking the Florida exam instead of staying with the UBE. Some jurisdictions in the UBE, like Texas, have a limit. I think the limit in Texas is five tries. If you're getting close to your limit, and let's say you're on try four, or this would be try five, what should you do? One possibility is to go to another UBE jurisdiction, sit for the exam there, which doesn't count as a Texas try, at least as I understand it, and see if you can get a high enough number. And if you get the 270 in Texas now, then you could wave in, you could go and apply that to Texas. But the idea of switching out of the UBE to go to Florida, for example, I think it's not wise. Now, again, I'm not giving individual advice, but I think Florida is a tougher test. I think California is a tougher test. Georgia is a tougher test. Pennsylvania, tougher test. You don't really want to get out of the UBE universe if you're in it, but you may have to change where you're sitting for the exam in order to avoid the number of tries. Sometimes just changing the environment can make a difference. We've had students that have switched from one UBE jurisdiction to another, and somehow that makes a difference for them. But typically where we see the greatest success is somebody coming from Florida or California or Georgia or some non-UBE jurisdiction into the UBE, and then they hit this number and then their score just goes crazy. And I think I wanna use this moment to plug an interview if I can, Megan. You and I worked with a student named Delisa, and Delisa started in North Carolina in 2003, not with us, but she took the exam intermittently over an 18 year period. And then North Carolina switched to the UBE. She came to us prepared and she got an unbelievable score, an extraordinary score. She not only passed North Carolina, but she got a big enough score. She didn't go anywhere she wants. 
I did an interview on YouTube with Delisa last week, and I honestly believe it's maybe the best interview I've I've been part of, not because of me, but because of her. I strongly encourage all of you to watch it. It's 25 minutes. It will be 25 minutes you will never forget. It is incredibly powerful. I will tell you to bring some Kleenex. But Delisa's story is remarkable, and I think it shows you what is possible. And if you're someone that just got results and they aren't what you had hoped for, then you can absolutely take great comfort and encouragement from this. And if you've not yet taken the exam, I think you'll be encouraged, but I think everybody would get something out of it. And what she has to say about how she studied and what she did is just oh, it's mind blowing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I know. It's really wonderful. I know, it's so great when that happens. Yeah, it really is. All right, I'm wondering whether I might need some adjustments to my device. It's a laptop that can be a tablet that I'm gonna use for the upcoming New York bar exam. How helpful were the mock exams in helping people understand how to go about doing the exam? Did you get sufficient exposure to all the technical aspects? Could you spot deficiencies early, et cetera? Yeah, I would start with this. I think using a, a tablet that doubles as a laptop is a horrible idea. Go get a laptop. They're not that expensive, but just get a dedicated device to use. I think the more complexity you add, the worse it gets, to be honest. And, and then you got to get the software loaded and that's a challenge and then it's got to work properly, but you need to take the mock test, the sample test that they give you. Here's the thing. And, and Megan, you say this a lot, follow the directions, go yeah. to the examiner's website, read the directions and do what they tell you to do. I cannot believe how many students invest all of this time and energy and money and then blissfully ignore the instructions from the examiners and exemplify and exam soft and then wonder why nothing works. You've got to do what they tell you to do and don't think you can find a shortcut around it or a less expensive solution. Not that I think this is necessarily, but do what they tell you to do. This is, it's serious stuff. And when they've got directions about where the room has to be and what's in the room and what can be shown and so on, these things matter and people get flagged for violations. Now we're seeing pretty frequently. I know there've been some comments in the Facebook group that were responsive to this individual's question. And I'll let those stand because people have been through that right lately. But I, I would just say, get a laptop and follow directions. You want to add anything to that? Yes. And you should definitely do the mock exams too. If your jurisdiction, I think they all do at this point. If you're taking it online, they're going to give you mock exams. You yeah. should do them. Uh, you do not want to walk in or even if walk in means into your living room on the, the day of the exam and sit down and have that be the first time that you have opened the software. So I think most places now require you to do at least one mock exam because they want to troubleshoot and have you make sure that the software is properly downloaded on your computer, all that stuff before you start. But regardless, you should do them because there's so much valuable information, I think, to be gleaned from that. There's no reason you would not you wouldn't get in a car like for the very first time on the day of your driver's test. So same thing, please don't pull up the exam soft software for the very first time on the day of the bar exam. Yeah, you should be looking at that stuff now. I know for some of you, it feels like the bar exam is like right now, it's not. But for some of you, you're like, well, it's a long way away. It's not, <laughs> it's about 90 some days. And this is the time to be looking at that stuff. And for God's sake, read your emails from the bar examiners. Do that. Check your spam folders, your promotions tabs and make sure you're reading everything from them. People get distracted, they don't pay attention, and then they just make grievous errors that cause them incredible difficulty on the exam. Being a lawyer is being detail-oriented and the examiners really don't cut you any slack for that. Yeah, you know? all right, great. So now we've got several MBE type questions. Now I do wanna talk about one thing we added that I'm pretty excited about. We put a new, group of questions, not new questions, but we took a hundred questions from every subject and then some extras for Civ Pro actually. And we put them in an 800 question database and put it online as a randomized set of questions. Now, if we were really KG Megan, what we should have said is that there is an algorithm to it, but there isn't. Anyway, there's 800 questions. And I would encourage you, particularly if you're retaking the exam, do a set of those questions every day or two just to give you like 10 questions, 15 questions at a time that are randomized through the subjects and the material. That's very different than our normal structure through the questions. Yeah. Okay, so next we got a handful of questions this week about MBE percentages and stress levels. So let me just 
quickly summarize. We've got several that are talking about, is this percentage of questions in this specific subject good enough to pass? Should I keep going if I scored too low on a specific MBE subject? Should I go back and re-listen to the lectures? Someone else saying, I'm having a lot of anxiety that like I should be doing better on my uh, subject specific MBE questions. Yeah. I know you've got some thoughts about this too, but I would say, first of all, it is way too early to be stressing about that. The multiple choice questions are not there to be predictive at this point. We, we do have some predictive tests that you'll take later in the course, but that's not where we are. And 95% of you are not in that spot right now. The purpose of these questions is to help you with the learning. It's part of the step or spaced repetition. And so you should be using them to develop your mind maps or to take your notes or to, to really develop a deeper understanding of the subject. And this is the honest truth. I don't care what percentage of questions you get right at this point. Really, I don't care. You tell me 60%, yay. You tell me 20%, okay. I, I have exactly the same reaction to both because it doesn't matter. I have never found a correlation in 30 plus years between performance at this stage and performance on the bar exam. And I really mean that. When these multi state questions were first developed at Harvard in SMH, which is the oldest bar review in America, which was our predecessor. We never saw a correlation between performance in the early stages and performance ultimately. It just isn't there. That's why I tease about the algorithm. It's all just made up stuff. And so don't stress about how many questions you're getting right. Now, I know some people talk about the fact that I mentioned in the introductory lectures a target goal that I'd like. But that target goal is more for the mixed question practice later in the exam and not for what you're doing in these 25 or 30 questions per subject. It's not enough questions to really give you a good percentage anyway, but it's really not for that purpose. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think the first thing is every question that we got about this was a subject specific mm -hmm. section. So they were doing like crim law, for instance, and the bar is not tested that way. So those questions are given to help you learn crim law, not to help if you're going to pass them. The MBE does not say, here are the crim law questions, answer all the crim law questions, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes, we know that when they calculate it out, they'll break it down and they'll say, this is the percentage of crim law questions you got, right. but you're not going to ever see that as you're taking it. So you're not going to know it's a crim law question first. You're certainly not going to have 25 crim questions in a row. So it's useless because it's like, oh, okay, great. Well, sure, if crim law, if you do a hundred crim law questions, but you're not going to get a hundred crim law questions on the MBE. That's not going to happen. So I just think it's like, there's a bit of a disconnect in just understanding what is the actual test like. And so this couldn't possibly be predictive because it's nothing like the test. So this is, you are so far out from the test at this point. This is the learning that subject. So it's getting used to how to do the MBE question, certainly. But honestly, what I'm more concerned about for you is, are you reading the answer explanations or listening to the lecture about it? Are you mind mapping what you learned? And are you going over it and making sure that it makes sense? So if there's anything that you're like, don't know that concept of law is just right over my head, then you go back and you figure it out until you're like, okay, I think I have a better understanding of it now. That's the purpose of these. Going through the why you got something right or wrong is really the key at this stage. So when you're in these subject-specific MBE questions, stop thinking of them like you're taking the MBE and start thinking of them as these are just the way that the lecture and the outline and the essays, they all are a piece of going through the subject material so that you get an understanding of it as opposed to just okay, great. I listened to the lecture. Now I know everything. Of course yeah. not. The MBE question is helping you practice and understand it. I think that's really right. I, the other part of this, of course, is the underlying question about being stressed out 90 days before the exam. I want to offer you a couple of different tools that we've got that can help. We have something called the Abundance for Bar Study Masterclass. This is a 90 minute masterclass that I taught that has gotten incredible uh, response from students. They claim that it's, some of them have said it's the best $150 they ever spent. It's really designed to help you with activating your brain in the most productive ways when it's necessary and controlling your emotions really and, and mindset. I would really encourage you to sign up for that masterclass. It's on demand. You can watch it as often as you want. I have people that have registered for it that watch it on a regular basis. You'll hear people 
when we're doing the interviews of successful students who talk about taking that master class and how they used it over and over again. So I think that's one really important resource. We also have resources like paraliminal recordings, and we have a set of videos in your video countdown tab in your course. Uh, you will see something called self-care. It's a series of videos that I've recorded that are designed really for your self-care, for your ability to take care of yourself as you're going through this process and not let the emotion and the stress get to you. And I think some, some of these questions we're getting about multiple choice performance really are just reflective, don't you think, of that stress that people are feeling right now? Definitely. Yeah. It's human nature. We want to cling to something that tells us like, oh, okay, I'm going to be okay. I, I did what I need to and I'll be fine. Or, but the sort of bad part of that is people can also cling to it as, oh no, I didn't hit this mark, so I'm not. There's no way I could pass when really, gosh, you have such a long road of studying ahead of you. I don't expect you at today to have mastery of crim law for the bar exam. But the good news is the exam's not this week, so you're fine. You don't have to have mastery of it yet. Okay. And then Megan, as you and I know, having done this for years and years, 90 days is forever, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It, I think it's true what you said earlier, that there are some people who are taking the, the July exam who feel like it's tomorrow, and there's some people taking the July exam who feel like I have all the time in the world. So, yeah. We can just meld those together. All right, let's go to a few questions in the chat box. So did most takers find a difference in the remote setting? Specifically, what did Delisa find most helpful for the UBE in the remote setting? Yeah, you'll see in her interview, she says something that we hear a lot from people that were taking the remote test, in Florida, other places. It was more convenient. She got to sleep in her own bed. She got to eat in her own kitchen. She got to use her own bathroom. She didn't have to travel. It worked really well. I did an interview with a student who took the UBE in Washington State. We'll release that this week. She also talks about the advantage of the remote exam and how helpful it was for her. And she actually had to move out of her house because they were doing construction. I can relate. And But she went to another home and took the exam and loved doing that. So I think most of the feedback I'm getting, and I think it's true for you as well, Megan, most of our students like the remote exam. There are a handful that had some tech problems for sure. But for the most part, the, the feedback has been positive. Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you're taking it in your own home, that's probably not anything to be stressed about. It seems to be like a real stress reliever for most people. So just yeah. get the tech figured out today. Don't wait. Yeah, please. Anne asked, if you graduated from an accredited school, but non-ABA school in California, what states can you take the bar in? Unless I'm misunderstanding her question, when we say accredited, that means ABA accredited. So it's, it's not accredited. It's yeah. not accredited law school. Okay. It's one state. Yeah, California. I know. It's very, we talk about this often. I think we were talking about it earlier, not even knowing this question. I'm so sorry because I just feel like it's a bummer. The unaccredited law schools, I, I'm not quite sure why California allows it, but it, what it does is it, makes you have to stay in California. So you have to take the California bar. And I know that's really difficult because it is the hardest bar exam in the country. And students who come from unaccredited law schools in California have really low pass rates of the California bar. And so we will do everything that we can to get you over the finish line. We have gotten people over the finish line in California from unaccredited schools, but it unfortunately you can't go into the UBE. So that's what we would tell you to do. If you have that option. And, we, and we've got this in some other states as well. It's not just California, but Massachusetts has an unaccredited school. There's a couple of others, and it's just heartbreaking. We've got students that are getting passing scores, but they're not hitting the specific score of the state they're in. And it's just, oh man, it's just so frustrating. And we had some foreign trained attorneys who passed the UBE, basically, but didn't get the score they needed in their state, and they aren't entitled with their score to get into some of these other UBE states. So. Look, the system is wildly imperfect right now, and we know it's frustrating. I will tell you that you will pass. And the time will come. That's very little consolation in that exact moment when you're looking at your score and you know that if you were able to apply it to another state, it would have been good enough. And in California, where it's now 278 in effect, which is still a pretty outrageous score, but you hit that number and you think, wow, I could be licensed in 32 states if I wasn't in California. So. Yeah, I know. Um, all right. That's all that we have for today. We got anything else to cover? I think that's it. I just keep going. Like people who feel like the exam is tomorrow, take some deep breaths, 
abundance for the bar exam, get a good mindset. People who feel like the bar exam is ages away, just a little pep in your step. Okay. Like just don't, <laughs> don't freak out. No stress. We don't want to push you into the stress, but definitely keep moving, yeah. keep pushing yourself to write yeah. those essays. Don't put off writing the essays. Okay. No matter what, if, whether you're talking to Jackson or me, you need to be writing, actually writing, typing up these essays. So yeah, keep the pedal down. But I, I don't know. I feel like people on the whole are like, like a calmer bar season than last year. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be back again. Thank you for being with us, Megan. We'll look forward to seeing all of you and uh, reading your questions and working through it. Have a good study week. Stay healthy, everybody. And we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening and watching the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers at celebrationbarreview.com. 